Consider the fact that right now there's an SUV-sized rover crawling around the surface of Mars, zapping rocks with its laser, scooping and sampling material, and generally giving us the best view we've ever seen from the surface of the red planet. NASA's Curiosity rover has been on the surface of Mars since 2012, following the story of water. When did it first show up on Mars, and was it there long enough to support the biology of life? In its five years and counting of exploration, Curiosity has pushed our understanding of the red planet forward and paved the way for the next generation of gigantic nuclear-powered rovers heading to Mars to search for life itself. Welcome to a special two-part collaboration with one of my favorite science and space YouTubers, Joe Scott. In his Answers with Joe series, Joe has dug into the history of SpaceX, how synesthesia works, and of course, my favorite topic, the Fermi Paradox. It turns out that while I was working on a History of Curiosity episode, Joe was working on a video about the upcoming Mars 2020 rover, the sequel to Curiosity, so it just seemed natural to collaborate. As always, I'll put a link to Joe's episode in the cards, show notes, and end credits. Watch these videos in any order that you like. Now here's what Joe has to say. Hi, I'm Joe Scott, and I am super thrilled to be collaborating with Fraser on this topic. Over here on my channel, I talk about all kinds of science stuff, from life extension to futurism to space travel, but today I'm going to be focusing on NASA's follow-up to Curiosity, the Mars 2020 rover. So when Fraser's done blowing your mind, I invite you to come check out my video to see how NASA plans to follow that up and what new discoveries we might find in the future. Anyway, hope to see you there. Now back to Fraser. Originally known as the Mars Science Laboratory, NASA's Curiosity rover is part of a global effort to research the history of Mars, specifically what happened to its water. Here on Earth, life is everywhere. Wherever you can find liquid water, you'll find life. Mars, on the other hand, is a dried and dead world, with only its polar ice caps for evidence that there was ever water on that world. Was Mars always as dry and frigid, or did it have water long ago when the solar system was younger? NASA's Spirit and Opportunity rovers were sent to Mars to answer the question, was there ever liquid water on the surface of Mars? Actually, after 13 years on the surface of Mars, with Opportunity continuing to send back the science, the better question might be, how long can a rover survive and how much punishment can it handle? By 2015, Opportunity had completed an actual marathon on the surface of Mars. Just a couple of days ago, it saw its 5,000th sunrise. But back to the water question. In 2004, NASA announced that Opportunity had landed in a region that had once been drenched in water and would have been a good habitable environment. It found tiny spherical pebbles known as concretions, which would have needed water to form. It found examples of chemicals like sulfates, hematite, and jerosite that would have required water to form. But was water located on the surface of Mars long enough to support life? This was Curiosity's job. Not only to find evidence of water, but to find out how long water had been present on the surface of Mars. Three, two, one. Main engine start, zero. And liftoff of the Atlas V with Curiosity. Seeking clues to the planetary puzzle about life on Mars. Curiosity was launched on November 26, 2011, and arrived at Mars on August 5, 2012. Unlike previous rovers and landers, Curiosity was huge, the size of an SUV. In order to enable the landing of a rover this massive, NASA had to develop an entirely new landing system, which used a series of methods to slow its descent to the surface of the red planet. When it hit the atmosphere, Curiosity used an aeroshell to bleed off as much velocity as possible.
Then it discarded the arrow shell and deployed a huge parachute. But the parachute alone wasn't enough to slow it down. As it got close to the surface of Mars, the vehicle Sky Crane fired its retro rocket, slowing its descent, and gently placed the rover on the surface of Mars. Curiosity had landed in the region of Mars known as Gale Crater, and the crater was formed billions of years ago when a huge asteroid smashed into the surface of Mars and it dug out this massive crater 154 kilometers across. As the gouged material rebounded and fell back to the surface, it created the central Mount Sharp, five kilometers high. This natural excavation gave mission controllers the perfect spot to see the natural layers of rock that had been deposited over eons. And it appeared that layers of material had been deposited into the crater by water, filling it up. And then over an even longer time, wind erosion blasted away that material until Mount Sharp was all that remained. And it was there that Curiosity landed at the foot of Mount Sharp, ready to slowly climb its way up the flanks, studying the material deposits and following the story of water on the surface of Mars. Spirit and Opportunity were powered by solar panels. Curiosity, on the other hand, is so much larger, and so it uses a radioisotope thermoelectric generator for electricity, a chunk of decaying plutonium that throws off so much heat it can be used to power a rover this big. With this much electricity, Curiosity has a suite of scientific instruments it can use to study the environment around it. The mass camera extends up above the rover and allows it to scan its surroundings with a high definition camera. It can take single exposure color pictures similar to your smartphone or monochrome images using a filter to show different parts of the light spectrum. It can even record video, so if a Martian creature should happen to scamper by. The Mars Hand Lens Imager allows Curiosity to look at close in detail at the rocks around it. Using the equivalent of a magnifying glass attached to the end of its arm, it has different lights that it can use to illuminate the rock to pick out different features. APXS is the Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer, which can be placed right next to a rock to find out exactly what it's made of. ChemCam consists of a laser that Curiosity blasts out from its mast at targets up to seven meters away. And the laser vaporizes a tiny bit of rock, which Curiosity can analyze to see what it's made out of. Chemin, or the Chemistry and Mineralogical Instrument, gathers rock samples, pulverizes them, and then beams x-rays through the powder to study what they're made of. SAM is the sample analysis of Mars. It's like an oven inside Curiosity. It picks up samples, heats them until they vaporize, and then studies the gases to find out what was in the sample. The minerals in these samples will tell scientists if Mars was once habitable. The Radiation Assessment Detector, or RAD, measures the ongoing radiation on the surface of Mars, as well as the amount of radiation the mission received on its voyage from Earth to Mars. The Dynamic Albedo of Neutrons, or DAN, is an instrument designed to measure the amount of water ice located in the regolith beneath the rover's wheels. And the Rover Environmental Monitoring Station measures what the weather's like on Mars. And there were a couple of other instruments that helped study what was happening as the spacecraft was coming in for a landing. Now, you know the incredible suite of instruments that Curiosity brought to bear on the Red Planet. Time to talk about the discoveries, and we'll talk about that in a second. But first, I'd like to thank Dave Johnson, Heroic Hedgehog, Stephen Tilly, Kurt Howes, Zach Schultz, Zachary Fluke, and the rest of our 805 patrons for the generous support. If you love what we're doing, you want to get in on the action, head over to patreon.com slash universe today. At the time that I'm recording this video, Curiosity has spent more than 2,000 Earth days crawling across the surface of Mars, triple its original mission plan. It's traveled a total of 18.01 kilometers and counting, so our opportunity still has it beat for distance traveled. And there are just too many highlights to get to for this video. Curiosity has taken thousands of pictures, sampled dozens of rocks, sniffed the atmosphere, sensed the radiation load, both on the surface 
And in space, that rover has seen things. Seen things. But over the course of more than five years crawling around the surface of Mars, Curiosity has added an enormous amount of data to planetary scientists' knowledge about Mars. Its main goal, of course, was that search for the history of water. By studying the isotopes of hydrogen, carbon, and argon in the rocks, Curiosity was able to determine that Mars once had a much thicker atmosphere and water on the surface of the planet. And then over the eons, the constant solar wind blasted its hydrogen into space, making it cold and dry. NASA's MAVEN orbiter continues to see this atmospheric loss to this day, and any future terraformers will need to deal with it. But it wasn't just through the decreasing water vapor in the atmosphere. Curiosity crawled into an ancient stream bed and found the kinds of rocks that would have tumbled downstream for several kilometers. At some point in the ancient past, there was a stream flowing here that was about knee deep, and it flowed for a long time. Curiosity found that Mars was once the ideal habitat for microbes. In an ancient mud deposit in a region called Yellowknife Bay, Curiosity found sulfur, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and carbon. Like This is how you get microbes. Not only that, but in the clay in the samples wasn't overly rich in salt, which means that it would have been drenched in drinkable water. But it found more than the raw chemicals of life. It found the organic molecules that make up life itself. It sampled rocks from a different region and turned up organic carbon compounds which had been preserved in the rocks. It's actually very difficult to know which compounds are present because of the toxic perchlorates that formed later and they alter the structure of the organic compounds. But the organics are in there. One of the most fascinating discoveries made by Curiosity was the detection of methane in the atmosphere of Mars. Now, methane on Earth is a byproduct of life, and it reacts quickly enough in the atmosphere that there must be some source replenishing it. But volcanism could also produce methane on Mars, so we still don't have a conclusive answer. One extremely interesting finding, however, was that during a two-month period, the background levels of methane jumped by a factor of 10. What could have caused this? We still don't know. Curiosity is absolutely sure, however, that the surface of Mars receives a high amount of radiation, and any humans who plan to visit Mars will need to limit their time on the surface. In just traveling to Mars, an astronaut would receive 15 times the annual radiation limit for a worker at a nuclear power plant, not to mention the time spent on the surface. Because Curiosity has such a long-lived power source, we can expect it to carry on for many more years, continuing to explore the environment inside Gale Crater, crawling up the flanks of Mount Sharp, following the history of water, and helping scientists on Earth understand this hostile environment. We don't know what it will find next, but we can be sure that there will be much more science coming out of this mission for years to come. And of course, I'll let you know when they find anything interesting. Now, don't forget to follow this story into the future. Joe Scott picks up the trail and talks about the future missions, which will be continuing the exploration of Mars. Did you watch the Curiosity landing live? Have you got fond memories of the mission so far? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. You want more space news? I'm now writing a weekly email newsletter that highlights many of the big stories that happened this week. It's quick, easy to digest, with lots of amazing pictures and videos, and you can find out more and sign up by going to universetoday.com slash newsletter. In our next episode, NASA made the announcement that they've narrowed down an upcoming mission to two candidates, a nuclear-powered helicopter for Titan or a return to Rosetta's Comet 67P. I battle Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, to convince you which mission they should support. Two missions enter, one mission leaves. That's next time. Finally, here's a playlist, starting, of course, with Joe Scott's half of the collaboration.